I'm going to continue talking about Enochian Judaism. It's from my book, The Lost Scrolls of Enoch. Right. I've discussed Enochian Judaism. I'm going to discuss it some more, but for now, I want to continue to go through this uh, story about the fall of angels. <clears throat> so, some argue that Enoch blames the fall of man and the corruption of mankind upon the watchers or the sons of God. Stories in Genesis about the sons of God beheld the daughters of men. They were fair and they took from among them wives as they chose. Let's look at this. Chapter 6 of... Uh, like I said, the, uh, the interpretation of this passage is uh, contested. But it says, yeah, when people began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. And then the Lord said, My spirit will not abide with mortals forever. They are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. So, uh, like I said, there's different interpretations. Were these fallen angels? Were these uh, just different orders of men? The sons of God are good men. The daughters of uh, the sons of God are good men. The daughters of men are, are, are women. They're born to wayward men. So this is disputed. I understand the different points of view on this passage of Scripture. Um, but some argue that the book of Enoch, which it states that these sons of God are you know, angelic beings, right? Some argue that Enoch blames the fall of man and the, and the corruption of mankind upon the watchers, that is, the sons of God. The watchers are an order of angels. There are the holy watchers, and it is from this uh, order of angels, according to the book of Enoch and Jude, that some of these angels left their first estate and fell into sin with women. This is what Jude says um, about this. And it seems to be clearly a reference. I'm going I'm to give a teaching this. I'm working on another booklet called uh, Enoch is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So it's like people who are, like, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. It's Jude. Verse 14, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things. Behold, the Lord comes and shall come with uh, 10,000 of holy saints, his, uh, holy ones. Um, but verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness and the judgment of the great day. That seems to that's, that, that seems to be alluding to or repeating, summarizing Enoch's account of the, what happens to these women who took Sorry, to these uh, sons of God, these angels who took human wives. So let's continue here. So this is a theological debate or discussion. And as I was saying before, I'm not saying that this happened or that happened. I'm just saying this is an important piece of literature from the time, before the time of Christ, actually. So those of the Calvinist school are very opposed to the concept of the watchers being responsible for the fall of man. The Calvinist theology is Adam and Adam alone who is responsible for the fall can be argued in their predestination uh, determinist system that it was God who predestined Adam to sin. Some Calvinists believe that Adam is the only human being who ever possessed free will, which he used to sin against God. And uh, of course the book of the Old Testament doesn't really go into the, all the uh, theological ramifications of the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and, and, and the fall. It describes what happened at you know, the beginning of the book of Genesis, but Adam's not even mention again for the rest of the Old Testament. Uh -huh. But of course, Paul and the other uh, apostles in the New Testament start exploring the concept of the fall of man. And then uh, Augustine, you know, built this elaborate uh, theological system on original sin, where sin is a, uh, sin's written into the human genome, according to Augustine. And the male human genome, that only a, a, a man carries, uh, males carry the, the mm -hmm. sin gene which they use, which they infect their sons and daughters. Because Adam's the one, Eve was deceived, Adam rebelled against God. In their system. In their system. The Jewish people don't believe in original sin or the, the fall of man in the same context of the, uh, as the Calvinist. They don't have that concept. But uh, it's interesting, if you look at apocryphal literature, I think Ezra's, uh, Second Esdras does, you know, some, sometimes they speak highly of Adam. You know, think of Adam walked with God. Adam had a special relationship with God. Of course, he lost that through disobedience. But um, 
I mean, the literature that the the, the pre-Christian pseudepigraphal Jewish literature, apocalyptic, uh, apocryphal Jewish literature that seems to have the concepts of the original sin in it. Uh, this literature is preserved by Christians and not Jews, and so I mean, if you're just going by the Old Testament itself, uh, uh, of course you can. I think you, you, there's a lot of texts about our sinful natures, right? There's none righteous, no, not one. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, these concepts are found in the old. Our righteousness is filthy lag, uh, rags. So, but the the ideas that are, uh, that are taken from the story of Garden of Eden by by uh, Calvin and, and before him Augustine uh, aren't clear. So the rabbis don't even have that that concept. But Calvinists are very sensitive about the ramifications or implications of the idea of not Adam sinning, but the sin of entering the world through deception, deceptive practice of the fallen angels. Of course, the, the book of Enoch doesn't contain the story of Adam. I think it alludes to it or mentions to it. Uh, it doesn't overtly contradict it either. Uh, the, ideas of, the ideas of the watchers being responsible for the fall of man. That's a this interpretation based on the text, not an overt statement from First Enoch. I don't think Enoch, like I said, doesn't have, it doesn't retell the story of the Garden of Eden, and it, uh, it talks about the Garden of Eden. It mentions Adam and Eve, but it doesn't help it tell the story. So uh, if you're looking through it, it's interesting. That's what that's what Margaret Barker does. Is she looks at the book of Enoch itself and says, okay, what is this book alone teaching about, you know, religious concepts? All right, let's continue here and read this. This is very interesting. The Book of the Watchers. As I mentioned, there's there's different books of Enoch. The Book of Watchers. Of course, you got Ethiopic Enoch has five books. The Book of Watchers, the Book of the Similitudes of Enoch, the Book of the Heavenly Luminaries, the Book of the Dream Visions, and the Epistle of Enoch. So, but scholars think that there's a, well, the Book of the Giants, which is not in the Ethiopic Enoch, but it seems to be part of the Book of Enoch that is used by the Dead Sea Scroll community, the Qumran community. And it's also found the Turfan scrolls in, in China. Uh, and then we have the Book of Noah. They think that the Book of Enoch is basically quoting from the lost Book of Noah. And they might have found books and uh, fragments of the Book of Noah among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you look into that. So there's certain sections that say, well, this seems to be uh, not from the Book of Enoch, but this is like parts of the Book of Noah that are incorporated into it. Okay, so the first book of the Books of Enoch is the Book of Watchers. And this is found in Greek. Um, I was reading about this. It's very interesting. We have this uh, kind of a messianic, ancient messianic Jewish Passover seder, the uh, the Paschal homily or sermon of uh, Melito of Sardis, written around the year 150. And uh, uh, one of these scholars wrote a book called The Lamb's High High Feast, where he's looking at the, uh, the early Jewish Christian sect founded by John the Apostle, called the Quattrodecimus. And uh, the, the, the manuscript that contains this ancient, which has been described as like a, a Jewish Christian Passover Haggadah, uh, that manuscript also contains part of the Book of Enoch yeah. in Greek. So, uh, like I said, the, the Book of Enoch was suppressed by, it was used as scripture by the earliest church fathers, the later church fathers, like Augustine, who I mentioned, decided to suppress the Book of Enoch. And... Uh, they work to suppress the Book of Enoch, so it's lost. But we have this. this is really, it's, the, that Greek manuscript has a, has a large section, uh, almost the entirety of the Book of, of the Watchers. It's the fragmentary. It's not the entire Book of Enoch, uh, but it's a large section. It's almost the entire first Book of Enoch, uh, first section of the Book wow. of Ethiopia, Ethiopia in Greek. Wow. Now, the Book of Enoch was probably written in Aramaic, the language of Jesus. But it's trans obviously, it's, it's uh, translated into Greek. And a fragment was discovered in this important manuscript discovery. So, uh, the Book of Watchers, which is an expansion of the story of Genesis 6, in which the fallen angels sexually reproduced with human women. That's, that's another problem. It's like, how could that happen? <laughs> you know, angelic beings are, are non-corporal, aren't they? It's very interesting. Uh, I was listening to this man. He has a channel called Religion for Breakfast. He's talking about Third Enoch. Second and Third Enoch. And, and it has this concept of, of God as having a body. Right, God doesn't need to have a physical body. He's he's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Right? How could God have a body if He fills all existence? 
He doesn't need a body. Right. Now, when would people see God? God can manifest himself in what's called a theophany, right? right? Like the burning bush. It's a vision, and it's a way for him to reveal himself to Moses. God's not the burning bush, right? Or right. the fire on Mount Sinai. That's right. He was revealing himself to Moses in a way that Moses right. could right. experience him with his sensations. Right. And Jesus has a physical body, right? Because he became incarnate. But God doesn't need to have, and he's not limited, right? Right. So uh, some people think, you know, think of God as having a body, but it's like, you know, he's not limited by any physical form, right? Right. So it's like, how how do angels reproduce? (laughs) Because God's an incorporeal spirit, universal spirit. What about angels? Angels are spiritual beings too. Yeah. They don't have a physical yeah. form of matter as we know it. That's the problem people have with the book. It's like how can how can these angelics a different order of existence? How can they sexually reproduce human beings? It's a good question. It's a good question. And, and I understand that that uh, reason for people uh, have expressing opposition to the book of Enoch. Maybe some people can say, well maybe it could happen this way or the other or some mysterious way we can't understand, but it can't happen. I, I don't know. I understand people's concerns, and I think that's a valid criticism, honestly. The first section of the book depicts the interaction of fallen angels with mankind. Sam Yaza, we have two the, lead, the, the two leaders of the false uh, of the fallen angels, uh, Azazel and Sam Yaza. Sam Yaza compels the other 199 fallen angels to take human wives to beget as children. Definitely. It says, and Sam Yaza, who is their leader, said to them, I fear... You will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of this great sin. Mm-hmm. And they all answered and said, Let us all swear an oath and bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. And they all swore together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And and they were all two hundred who descended upon in the days of Jared upon the mountain of uh, the summit of the Mount of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. So it also discusses the teaching of humans by fallen angels, chiefly Azazel. It says, And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them, and bracelets and ornaments, and the use of an- antimony, and the beautifying of the eyelids, and all kinds of costly stones and coloring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray, and they became corrupt in their ways. Some Yaza taught attachments. I'm sorry, taught enchantments. And root cuttings. Armeros resolving the enchantments. Barakiel taught astrology. Cockabel the constellations. Ezekiel the knowledge of the clouds. Arachiel the science of the earth. Samsiel the science of the sun. And Serial with the course of the moon. So it's like these, these fallen angels, in a sense, they civilize mankind, but they're also corrupting mankind, especially with violence teaching violence and fighting and warfare among people. It's interesting that Azazel is used in reference to the scapegoat in Leviticus 16, verse 8, where it says, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goods, one for the Lord and the other for Azazel. It's like uh, Bingo has decided to join, join us for service. He's coming over here. <laughs> All right. The names of the leaders are given as Sam Yaza, their leader, Arachiel, Ramiel, Kakabel, Tamiel, Ramiel, spelled differently, Daniel, Hazakiel, Barakiel, Esiel, Armeros, Batriel, Ezeiel, Ananiel, Zachiel, Semsiel, Satariel, Turiel, Yomiel, and Suriel. This results in the creation of the Nephilim in Genesis or the Anakin Anak as they're described in the book. So here we go. Come on, buddy. He wants to sit church cat. He wants to come to church and join us for service. So uh <laughs> Let me look at this, then we'll, we'll conclude. So we have the names of these fallen angels. It says about the women, they became... they became. This is the problem. There's another problem people have with the Book of Enoch. It says, And the women, they became pregnant. They bare giants whose height was 300 eels. And they consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. They began to sin against the birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. So these are atrocious monsters, right? So, let's look at this. Uh, <laughs> you are a nuisance, Bingo. Uh, let's look at the scripture. This represents one of the issues that people have with the book of Enoch. 
unless this is an error in the manuscript, the Nephilim are described as being unbelievably tall. 300 L's would be taller than most uh, skyscrapers. So an L is like a cubit, right? So that means if there are 300, if there are 300 L's, that makes them 450 feet tall. And some manuscripts say 3,000, which, which would make them 4,500 um, feet tall. That's taller than the mountain. I think Mount Sinai is about that tall. It's, it's huge. So, so uh, this is one of the questions that people have uh, about uh, somebody's opening the door and letting all the animals come into the church. So let's continue reading. It says, Now the Israelite spies described their size compared to the, the Anakim as being like that of grasshoppers. However, the measured height of the Anakin, Goliath, is nine to 10 feet tall. Now some, including R.I. Burns, argued the Book of Enoch originally did not say how tall the giants were. Uh, contrary to how it's translated, some people contest that uh, Enoch 7.2 contains a scribal corruption in the Enoch, that the, the, uh, the Nephilim were, were 300 eels high, which is over 450 feet. Some modern textual scholars argue the Greek version of Enoch 7.2 is close to the original. Of course, we have the Greek manuscript, as I mentioned. Uh, this is translated, they translate verse 2 from the Greek text. It says nothing about the height of the giants, but said, instead says, And they conceived from them and bore to them giants. And the giants begot the Nephilim. And the Nephilim, to the Nephilim born the Eliod, who were growing in accordance to their greatness. The bottom line is originally the book of Enoch. Very likely not say how tall the giants were. However, it does mention that they're... They seem to be giants, and that they're they're so large. I mean, you could infer that from the scripture that they're so large they're consuming the world, right? There's not enough to sustain her because they're, they're tall. Uh, that could be argued from the text. So this is disputed. This first how it. So in the Ethiopic, <laughs> they're hundreds of feet tall, but in the Greek version, it doesn't say how tall they were. And we do have, this section is, is well preserved in, in the Greek. I think the only section that we have of the Book of Enoch in Greek uh, is the, the Book of the Watchers. Of course, I need, I need to do some more uh, research into that. Uh, it is a known fact that proper names like Eloid and Numbers, uh, 300 here, 3,000 eels, uh, suffer the most from scribal copying and translating over the millennia. Presumably, in ancient times, a uh, scribal copy is to understand proper name for Iliad, which is considered referring to the L, telling us how tall the giants were. To be clear, 3,000 L's in this Charles translation is not an error in the English translation, beginning with the ancient copyist mistake, uh, which changed the verse about the three, three races, the, uh, the watcher's offspring, and then changed uh, a verse, uh, okay, we changed a verse about the watcher's offspring, one of these races is called the Iliad, and the comment about the giant's height, Iliad become eels, for else and three became three thousand. My understanding. So this person is saying that a scribe made a mistake. That this text did not say that the giants were hundreds of feet tall. And he says he says we're mentioning a group of these giants is called the Iliad. So uh, that's the mis this is this only mistake by the translators not discerning the ancient uh, scribal error by by figuring out the better reading. Perhaps the scribal copyist error was a translation error. If the error was introduced, the scribe was not able to translate the verse this way. So that's interesting. Um, so it says, this is translated as, And there were born unto them three sorts, the first the great giants, and the giants were born the Nephilim, and the Nephilim were born the Iliad. So that's how some people deal with this. Because, I mean, you want us to believe, first, <laughs> first step of like you want us to believe that an angel procreated a human being. It's like, that's, that's difficult to understand how that could happen. And then you're going to say that these uh, these giants, the Bible describes the, you know, the giants being about 10 foot tall. You're saying that they're actually hundreds of feet tall. How the, how the Ethiopic uh, Book of Enoch is, is uh, read. But then we have the Greek version, and some people say, no, 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 this is a scribal mistake. In the Ethiopic, that originally the Book of Enoch did not say, uh, I'll have to look at, because like I said, we have fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Book of in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Enoch. So we got the, you got the Greek section, we got the Aramaic from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but Ethiopic in its entirety is preserved only, uh, only in Ethiopic. So the Watchers and their descendants, the Nephilim, began oppressing mankind. Then Enoch says, and men began to be 
And then, being destroyed, cried out, and their voice reached into heaven. And then the archangels, Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel, hearing the prayers of mankind, appealed to God to judge the inhabitants of the world and the fallen angels. And what I'm going to move on to there, from there, is the book of Giants. And uh, we'll talk about this the next time. But uh, as I said, in the Ethiopic version of the book of Enoch, the, the book of Giants is not present. They found the book of Giants in fragments among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then we had the Turfan Oasis where they found literature, Christian literature, the Jesus Sutras were found in the Turfan Oasis. And what happened is Aramaic Christian missionaries, Assyrian Christian missionaries went to China and they produced Christian literature explaining translations of scripture into Chinese explaining the gospel. And they used a lot of contextualization, which means they they described the gospel in a way in which they thought it could be more easily understood in a Chinese cultural concept. Yeah. <laughs> these these ideas of these of missionary they, they're kind of ahead of their time. They seem to be very modern, but uh, the the Christian evangelists arrived in China in uh, I think the year six thirty six is uh, when they first arrived and preached the gospel there. We have the, the Stone Sutra, as they call it, uh, which is in Cheyenne, China, which is in, it's in the Chinese and, and uh, Aramaic. So anyway, there's all these, these writings, these Chinese Christian writings that have been discovered by archaeologists and scholars in, in China, and they had this major manuscript discovery in the Turfan Oasis. We found a cave just full of scrolls, uh, which include the Jesus Sutras, and they also included... Uh, the Manichaean literature, including the version of the book of Giants. So Manny was a, uh, he was a, considered himself to be a prophet. He's what we call a Gnostic. Right. And uh, Manny, like he's an Aramaic Christian, he belonged to a baptizing sect similar to the Mandians, the Christians of St. John, as they call them. Um, and anyway, he started his own religion. And he, writ he wrote his own gospel and some religious texts. He's also an artist. He illustrated the books he wrote. Uh, some of the books have survived in translation uh, and been discovered, but some of his literature he produced is, uh, is, is lost. Uh, but one of the books that he produced as, as his sacred scripture uh, was his his version of the Book of Enoch, which is helpful. Uh, the book of, yeah, the Book of Enoch, but it's, his, it's from the Book of Enoch. He did his own version of the Book of Giants, which is discovered in the Turfan Oasis. So this is about the Nephilim yeah. and how they're, they're judged. And interestingly, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the scroll breaks off, mm -hmm. and the conclusion of the Book of Giants has not been preserved. Yeah. But it was preserved in the Book of Giants that was found in the Turfan Oasis. I believe it's written in a, uh, that version. It's in a, uh, a Persian uh, language. Yeah. So I'll discuss this nice. next time. The Book Let's of Giants. Pray. So this is. Hmm? Let's, pray. Let's have. A, we can conclude with the word of prayer. Yeah. Here we are. We have a, ha a, a hyper kitten. <laughs> He's almost full grown now, aren't you, Bingo? He doesn't know how to act right. Very cute friendly. Cute fella. Hey. Is a cute fella? Yeah, he's cute, but I think knocking over menorah and disrupting the service is not very cute. This is a sacrilegious kitty. He just wants to be held. He'll be nice prayer. I'm going to mom. All right, special prayer needs. What, what kind Me of prayer too. needs? You're going to pray for your mother. Gregory, do you have any Me prayer too. needs? Pray for you. Do you have any prayer needs or requests, Gregory? Right. Well, it's okay. We need to pray for the... I think we need to pray for the world and the, and the nation's safety. And, uh, you know, low, low, uh, low, uh, all right, let's, let's bow our heads and pray then. That's good. But, you know, for, 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 for someone who warned. Yeah, this, yeah, there's, a, there's Ukraine. And pray for safety, that yep. people will stop messing over one another. Yeah. Like that. This war in Ukraine is raging on and. It's sad. I think that we should have had a ceasefire or negotiations of peace. Instead, we're seeing Ukraine being totally destroyed. 
Right. I was talking to a lady from Ukraine the other day, and she's saying, you know, part of the problem is that Ukraine itself is so corrupt. You know, I don't want Russia to occupy Ukraine, but I mean, if you don't have a ceasefire, peace negotiations, it looks like Russia, sadly, Russia's winning. And uh, it's, it's awful. All right, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. I'm praying for you, Mother. Abba Father, we thank you for the blessings you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity and freedoms we currently enjoy in this country. We know that our current our freedoms are under threat by our government, which wants to strip us away of all of our citizenship and our freedoms and rights and make us subjects and serfs. Help us, Lord, to preserve our freedoms so that we can freely worship you. I pray for uh, the request that, that uh, Gregory brought up, that we'd have peace on earth, that people would treat each other with kindness and and, and treat each other justly and with respect. And uh, we pray uh, for peace and goodness among the peoples of the earth. And we pray for Chris, and turmoil that he's doing with, and his mother who's had medical attention, can't drive and stuck at home. And uh, just bless that family, that household, give them peace. We pray for our congregation. Pray for us, especially as we go in the feast days. Pray that you bless us and pray this to be a special time. Pray these things in Yeshua's holy name. Amen. Amen.